This film has been prepared as a companion to our exhibitions of 19th and early 20th century European sculpture. The present exhibition explores casting techniques, founders, editors, the various media employed, bronze, marble, wood or plaster, as well as works that exemplify the aesthetic differences in chasing and modeling techniques between 1800 and 1920. We hope this tour will give some insight and help to clarify some of the complexities involved in the appreciation of sculpture from this period. As the 19th century progressed, the growing bourgeois population increased the demand for luxury items. Foundries were in full production, providing statues, statuettes, fixtures, and bronze for palaces, villas, and luxury apartment houses, along with public buildings and monuments. The usual outlet for these wares were independent shops in elegant locations in major international cities. The term editor was usually given to these purveyors. One of the most obvious was Tiffany and Company, who had showrooms in international art centers. Eventually, the foundries themselves became purveyors, that is, editors of their own works and established showrooms, like the one we see here, which was that of the Erzgießerei in Vienna. Here we can see how such firms aesthetically dealt with the presentation of their wares. These two examples of Marie de Orléans' Jean d'Arc were cast by the same foundry, Sous Frère. From the foundry marks on the casts, it is possible to date the actual casting as circa 1870 for the small version and circa 1850 for the larger one. The sculpture was first conceived in 1835 and first cast in the 1840s. The viewer will note that the surfaces, patinas, and the chasing of details are consistent in the two casts and have a feeling of sculpture in the early to mid 19th century in France. The time lapse in the casting dates has not altered the aesthetics. The chasing and finishing of this Gloria Victus by Mercier is typical of the techniques employed by French founders from around 1800 to the end of the century. The viewer will immediately recognize the differences between Marie de Orléans' Jeanne d'Arc and Mercier's Gloria Victus. Cast by the firm of Barbedienne, the sculpture was available in various sizes, ranging from 24 inches to 72 inches. This example is the 55-inch size. Originally, it was conceived as victory lifting a soldier to a higher realm. 
Upon France's defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, Mercier changed the hero's head from lifted to fallen and broke off the tip of the sword in honor of the dead soldiers and particularly his friend, the artist Henri Regnault, who died in the final days of the war. This event is also commemorated in two medallions in two sizes, a small two and a quarter inch medal and a large 10 inch version. In the first case, Henri Dubois used the Mercier sculpture, and in the other, Alphée Dubois used Chapou's monument to Regnault, La Jeunesse. The Captive Amazon is a cast terracotta of a figure by Carrier Belleuz that was also rendered in marble and bronze. It dates from after 1868. This was a time in France of Rococo revival in interior decoration. With its lighter atmosphere, terracotta became a more appropriate sculpture medium, reinforced by the interest in the 18th century. Both Carrier Belleuz and Carpeau explored the possibilities of cast terracotta. Molds were made and casts would be done in much the same manner as in bronze casting. Additions and sizes would vary. Carrier Belleuse was very influential on the young sculptors of his day, particularly his student Rodin, who continued to consult him on technical matters. The difference between Central European casts and the more refined French casts can be seen in these two Austrian casts. One of Prince Eugen of Savoy by Alexei in 1844, and one of Schiller by Schilling of 1876. The casts of these works have brassy golden patinas and are quite heavy because the interior walls were thick, lacking the fluidity of the French casts of the same period. Though their casting was slightly inferior to the French, and there was virtually no modification in the techniques in those 40 years, they made up for it in the exquisite attention to the chasing of the bronze. Note the overall chasing on the Schiller bronze, right down to the buckles on the subject's shoes. Mm -hmm. 